All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Christina Colwick. I'm from the Gauteng City Region Observatory in Gauteng in South Africa. And essentially what I'm going to be doing um, in following up from Paul's really vibrant exploration of, um, of the website and the data portal and platform that they've put together is reflect a little bit of GCRO's experience in trying to gather data for um, an economic wide um, material flow analysis of Gauteng um, and, and where some of that data exploration has taken us um, over the last, um, the last number of years. But before I jump in, the Gauteng city region is the, um, the area that, that we focus on, um, our research is focused on. Now, it is centered around um, Gauteng province, but it doesn't stop at the end of the um, provincial boundary. As Paul was saying earlier, that no city is easily defined with a, a very clear boundary. And similarly for Gauteng, while we have Johannesburg, Pretoria, Kuruleni, and the smaller municipalities within the province, the actual functional boundary and the footprint of the city region extends far beyond the provincial boundary. So the idea around the, the Gauteng city region is taking that into account and, and saying we are more than just what the, the administrative boundary, boundary is. Um, the GCRO is a research institute that is based um, in Johannesburg, but our focus is on the Gauteng city region. We are set up by, uh, we're a three-way partnership um, between provincial government, Wits University, University of Johannesburg, and we also have local government um, in Gauteng represented on our board. So we are very much um, established to build the research base, the academic understanding of what Gauteng is, so that we can inform local and provincial government in understanding the, um, the city region so they can make more informed decisions. But of course, everything that we do is not just accessible to government. We um, also, like Paul was saying, really pride ourselves in open access, open, um, open data, and as, as much as we can, everything that we do, we post on our website and in as accessible formats as we can, from visualizing things um, to um, to putting them in different formats that are just accessible to, to a range of people and not just the, the academic audience. So the little bit of research that we do spans, well, <laughs> uh, we span quite a, quite a broad range of things from governance to economics to spatial change um, and social issues. But one of the, the key themes that we, um, that we do spend quite a bit of time on that I'm going to focus in on today is um, our sustainability um, research and essentially the the broader theme of research that we conduct under this theme um, really is based on the principle that cities can't continue to build in a way that takes um, no consideration to the fact that we have limited resources and we can't continue to externalize the, the environmental costs um, as we have done in the past so what does this type of thinking mean for urban and provincial governments when we're starting to think about a province like Gauteng that is the smallest province in the country, the most populated, and is um, bringing in people at a faster rate than any other area in, in the um, country, and how, what implication does that have on resources, um, our existing resource base, but also the resources that we import and then produce outside. So we've got a number of projects that look at different aspects of this, um, looking at green assets and infrastructure, that's uh, linked to the ecological infrastructure type work, um, dimensions of green economy, metabolic flows and infrastructure transitions, just sustainability transitions, um, and essentially what each of these projects tries to do is try to build a logic and an argument for um, government and, and people within Gauteng to start shifting not just um, a particular understanding but systemic wide understanding of how do we shift into a more sustainable um, trajectory. But zooming into our metabolic flows and infrastructure transitions project, the idea behind this project is very clearly um, tied to the focus of, of this workshop here. 
And the aim of this project is to examine the prospects of reducing resource consumption and um, waste flows through um, the transformation of infrastructure um, within Gauteng. And the idea was to track the different flows um, of water, energy, um, material, materials, waste, um, biomass through Gauteng, um, as Paul's been discussing and, and everyone has been discussing today. Um, and really the, the intention of it was to be a, a, a way for people in Gauteng to rethink how, um, how the city functions, taking a look at what ways, what opportunities there are to shift from our current trajectory into a more sustainable one. Um, so the project um, was initiated in 2011, 2012, um, and we set out to conduct an economy-wide material flow analysis. Um, we had really big um, uh, expectations, real big hopes for, for our being able to, to do this. And we spent a number of years gathering data, as much data as we could on waste flows, energy, water, f um, food, and a number of other types of materials. The data collection was done both by internal GCRO staff as well as commissioned experts within particular fields. And we, over those few years, were able to gather an incredible amount of data. And I think this just really does speak to the luxurious space in some ways that we have. Um, we've spoken about in Cape Town, Gauteng was also able to gather an incredible amount of data. And um, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of, of some of the initial results that we've managed to, to get. Um, the next few glass, a lot of them linked up. So here, the red line, perhaps it should be blue, um, but the red line relates to water abstraction. So just a little bit of context to Gauteng. We are a very highly populated province, but we do not have a major water source. So we import and pipe water hundreds of kilometers from another country, from Lesotho, all the way to Gauteng. And that is mainly stored in the Vaal River system. And then we... Um, we pump that out and then it gets distributed to Gauteng, um, to everyone, um, and also I think a, a little bit beyond the border, border of the province as well. But essentially what this graph shows you is um, over time how much water we've drawn from the dam in order to serve the province's needs. And you can see the, the grey line is GDP. So that's, you can see that the, the growth in GDP is semi-linked to how much water we, um, we abstract and use in the city region um, or Gauteng. I think this is strictly for Gauteng, um, the province. Um, uh, so that's 2001 or 2000 to, to 2011. You can see a small decoupling towards the end. We're also able to take a look at the um, the different energy sources. So this is just focusing on city of Chuane, one of the major metros in Gauteng. So for 2004, you can see the, the various um, industries and, and sectors of the economy that use different proportions of energy um, with industry and construction transport, similarly to Cape Town, taking a dominant, um, dominant role in energy. And that's also partly because of the sprawling nature of, um, of uh, Chuane and Gauteng um, itself and how dominant um, the transport sector is. Housing also takes about 20% and then commercial agriculture, mining and quarrying. Um, liquid fuel consumption, again, you can see what's really interesting if you take a look at the, the graph um, heading up and then takes a really strong dip in 2008, linking straight up with the, um, the global financial crisis. Um, and I'm sure there are a number of other factors that, that I'm not considering there. But again, um, to an extent, linking up with GDP growth. Um, this one is domestic scale uh, sales of cement. Um, and this is a really interesting flow. So the purple, again, is, it was the cement. Um, you'll notice that we have really good data from 2001 all the way up to 2008. And then it stops quite abruptly, and I'll get back to this. But again, really interesting to be able to see how 
uh, boom in the, um, in the building sector is really quite clearly shown by this data, uh, really like clearly identifying how, um, how the material that's being translated into those, those building stocks um, is quite clear through, through the cement sales. Now, although we had some really great successes and, and those graphs show at quite a high level that we were able to gather some types of sense. So certainly we didn't manage to get to the point of, um, of doing a full flow of di different sectors through the province for a number of reasons. Um, but what I'm going to focus in now is a little bit of um, our reflection on some of the challenges with data that, that Paul has mentioned up until now. Um, and um, I'll focus on three different types of data challenges that we had. Firstly, data availability challenges, um, mm. boundary issues, and then data anomalies. Um, so in terms of data availability, I'm going to zoom back to this particular graph here. So in some cases, we had really great access to data. In some cases, it was a lot harder to find data. Now, the reason why I'm going back to this data is the cement data is because up until 2008, there was a really fantastic set of accessible data on cement. It was um, gathered, collected, stored in an open, um, in an open format that really gave a, a fantastic, uh, rich source of data. In 2008, there was a competition commission finding that this data set was the source of collusion and the data source was shut down. And um, so the different industry players were using this data for collusion purposes. So the data stopped. They were not allowed to collect any data. It's not openly accessible anymore. You cannot find this data anywhere. So we have really great data up until 2008, and then nothing at all. Um, we've mentioned and spoken quite a bit about boundary issues. And as Paul was saying, any city is going to have boundary issues. In Gauteng, we have boundary issues on steroids. We have not just one city, we have three of the country's major municipalities on each other's borders. We have uh, municipalities that are really close by, functionally connected to the city region, economies that are functionally connected but do not fit within the administrative boundaries. Different municipalities collect data in different ways. Different um, custodians deal with them in very different ways and gathering a full sense of what happens in a functional city region is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And that's something that we found um, increasingly um, as a challenge when you're trying to look at this city region that wasn't a single city. Um, then, Shifting onto some data anomalies. So, so the graphs up until this point have been showing have been the the broad level um, Gauteng level results or city level results, and um, and mostly they look pretty credible. So this one is a new graph. This one is looking at municipal solid waste. Um, per year from 2001 to 2011. So that's the blue line. Again, the gray line is GDP growth. So here this one's a little bit of an erratic graph, but at a, at a broad level looks like it, it, it might, be, might be feasible. It doesn't look actually fundamentally different to perhaps the, the graph um, that we saw, that scatter plot earlier today from some of the surge. So I know they're very different things, but, but the, there's, there's fluctuation over the years that, that maybe could be plausible. However, what we realized is that at the broad scale, these fluctuations actually were resulting from data availability from the different cities. In some years, some cities had data available, and in other years, they didn't have data available. So where you have drops in this graph, it's actually related to the fact that some cities weren't reporting that year. So, makes this broad level, da level data very difficult to actually use at all or, or, or feel like we've got any real sense of understanding what the trend over time actually is. Um, then when we started looking at, um, um, 
it's, oh dear. Ah, there we go. Um, when you start looking at a year where we did have a full set of data, um, we can see that graph that looks at the different municipalities. So Chwane on the far left, Johannesburg, Ikuruleni, and then the two um, uh, district municipalities, Sedibang and West Rang, all together um, equaling that, that final total on, on the right-hand side. Now, also, again, broad level, you'd think, oh, maybe that's plausible. Anyone who understands and knows Gauteng will know that Chwane is a much smaller city in terms of population than Johannesburg. Not only that, it is also much less economically active. So the likelihood of Chwane producing more solid waste than Johannesburg is virtually inconceivable. So we then started looking at that saying, okay, well, why are we getting results for Johannesburg? These are the official results that the cities are gathering for themselves. How is it that China is gathering data that is so much higher than what Johannesburg is? And so this is when we started doing a little bit more qualitative analysis based on, um, based on these findings and started finding that there seemed to be some type of issue at the way bridges, at, at the point at which um, the data is being collected. So what happens is the, uh, the trucks go into the, the landfill, they get weighed. Um, the private ones, depending on what, what weight of, of load they're carrying, that relates to how much they, they need to pay. Now you can very quickly realize that there's a disincentive to bring, not only firstly come to the, the, the legal um, landfills because you're going to have to pay um, <laughs> the, re the required amount to dump your waste in, in an appropriate way. So one side of things is people, and, and you see this quite a lot, um, particularly in formal settlement areas, that someone will say, okay, well, if you give me 100 rand, you can dump your stuff here. So that's completely bypassing um, the, the formal system. But what we were finding at the way bridges is that in some cases, the people in charge of the way bridges were, um, were getting bribed to weigh at a lower level or, or to reflect that what they were weighing was much less so that the charges on that, um, on that truckload was less than what it should be. You also find a lot of way bridges then not only just weighing less, but actually just not working and there was no incentive um, for the people reporting there to report that these way bridges were not actually working. So when you start digging down into the actual data at a high level, they might have seen plausible. Looking deeper down, we said we've actually got some functional problems with actually understanding our waste flows completely. Um, but does this mean that the data collection process was, was a waste? Absolutely not. What we've found is that these are just a couple of examples, um, but we've got a number of streams of research that, has been, that have been initiated, a, an ethnographic um, investigation into the, the water um, department in the city of Joburg to try and understand data of water um, uh, and a range of other avenues of research that this initial data gathering um, has, has flagged as we actually don't understand why is this data looking like this? Why can we not get the data? Um, and starting to ask some of the, the sociological, anthropological questions around um, understanding, are there some disincentives, not just for, from a data gathering perspective, but in terms of shifting towards a more sustainable trajectory. So we are convinced that not only is it important to continue doing this, in type, this type of um, analysis, um, the, uh, the material flow analysis, but um, it's important, I think, and I think this is some of the work that, that Paul, at the back, that side, has been working on, is looking at how do we combine not just the high-level data, but combine it with, um, with neighborhood and, and bottom-up uh, survey in household and, and neighborhood level data, how do you punctuate um, um, and um, that, that high level data? Important to understand what the, um, the political ecology, the sociology questions, what are the governance structures in place that are maybe not facilitating a gathering of the data, but also, as I mentioned, the, um, the shift, the sustainable shift. 
Um, and I think just to just to close off, what has to be, and I think that Paul was mentioning this, this type of analysis, these type of research um, projects are only useful if they're helping us as cities understand the space better to be able to move in a more sustainable trajectory. They have to be usable, applicable and functional for the governments and the entities who are working to understand our cities and move them to a more sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you.